I walked along the Minsk station platform beside those same bandits as if nothing at all were amiss, but the station was still a ruin. And now I was leading the Smirsh men through the circular upper concourse of the Bielorussian radial subway station on the Moscow Circle Line, with its white ceiling dome and brilliant electric lights, and opposite us two parallel escalators, thickly packed with muscovites, rising from below. It seemed as though they were all looking at me. They kept coming in an endless ribbon from down there, from the depths of ignoring tilde N and on beneath the gleaming dome, reaching toward me for at least one word of truth so why did I keep silent? Every man always has handy a dozen glib little reasons why he is right not to sacrifice himself. Some still have hopes of a favorable outcome to their case and are afraid to ruin their chances by an outcry. For, after all, we get no news from that other world, and we do not realize that from the very moment of arrest our fate has almost certainly been decided in the worst possible sense and that we cannot make it any worse. Others have not yet attained the mature concepts on which a shout of protest to the crowd must be based. Indeed, only a revolutionary has slogans on his lips that are crying to be uttered aloud, and where would the uninvolved, peaceable average man come by such slogans? He simply does not know what to shout. And then, last of all, there is the person whose heart is too full of emotion, whose eyes have seen too much, for that whole ocean to pour forth in a few disconnected cries. As for me, I kept silent for one further reason, because those muscovites thronging the steps of the escalators were too few for. 18. Backslash. The Gulag Archipelago. Me. Too few. Here my cry would be heard by 200 or twice 200, but what about the 200 million? Vaguely, unclearly, I had a vision that someday I would cry out to the 200 million. But for the time being I did not open my mouth, and the escalator dragged me implacably down into the nether world. And when I got to Okhodni Riyadh, I continued to keep silent. Nor did I utter a cry at the Metropole Hotel. Nor wave my arms on the Golgotha of Lubyanka Square. Mine was, probably, the easiest imaginable kind of arrest. It did not tear me from the embrace of kith and kin, nor wrench me from a deeply cherished home life. One pallid European February it took me from our narrow salient on the Baltic Sea, where, depending on one's point of view, either we had surrounded the Germans or they had surrounded us, and it deprived me only of my familiar artillery battery in the scenes of the last three months of the war. The brigade commander called me to his headquarters and asked me for my pistol. I turned it over without suspecting any evil intent, when suddenly, from a tense, immobile suite of staff officers in the corner, two counterintelligence officers stepped forward hurriedly, crossed the room in a few quick bounds, there. Four hands grabbed simultaneously at the star on my cap, my shoulder boards, my officer's belt, my map case, and they shouted theatrically, you are under arrest. Burning and prickling from head to toe, all I could explain was, me. What for? And even though there is usually no answer to this question, surprisingly I received one. This is worth recalling, because it is so contrary to our usual custom. Hardly had the Smirsh men finished, plucking, me and taken my notes on political subjects, along with my map case, and begun to push me as quickly as possible toward the exit, urged on by the German shellfire rattling the window panes, then I heard myself firmly addressed yes.
Across the sheer gap separating me from those left behind, the arrest I-19 gap created by the heavy falling word, arrest, across that quarantine line not even a sound dared penetrate, came the unthinkable, magic words of the brigade commander, Solzhenitsyn. Come back here. With a sharp tum I broke away from the hands of the Smirsh men and stepped back to the brigade commander. I had never known him very well. He had never condescended to run of the mill conversations with me. To me this face had always conveyed an order, a command, wrath. But right now it was illuminated in a thoughtful way. Was it from shame for his own involuntary fiat in this dirty business? Was it from an impulse to rise above the pitiful subordination of a whole lifetime? Ten days before, I had led my own reconnaissance battery almost intact out of the fire pocket in which the twelve heavy guns of his artillery battalion had been left, and now he had to renounce me because of a piece of paper with a seal on it. You have, he asked weightily, a friend on the first Ukrainian front. It's forbidden. You have no right. The captain and the major of counterintelligence shouted at the colonel. In the corner, the suite of staff officers crowded closer to each other in fright, as if they feared to share the brigade commander's unbelievable rashness, the political officers among them already preparing to present materials against him. But I had already understood. I knew instantly I had been arrested because of my correspondence with a school friend, and understood from what direction to expect danger. Zakhar Georgievich Travkin could have stopped right there. But no. Continuing his attempt to expunge his part in this and to stand erect before his own conscience, he rose from behind his desk he had never stood up in my presence in my former life and reached across the quarantine line that separated us and gave me his hand, although he would never have reached out his hand to me had I remained a free man. And pressing my hand, while his whole suite stood there in mute horror, showing that warmth that may appear in an habitually severe face, he said fearlessly and precisely, I wish you happiness, Captain. Not only was I no longer a captain, but I had been exposed. 20 I the Gulag Archipelago as an enemy of the people, for among us every person is totally exposed from the moment of arrest. And he had wished happiness to an enemy. Ate the pains rattle. The German shells tore up the earth 200 yards away, reminding one that this could not have happened back in the rear, under the ordinary circumstances of established existence, but only out here, under the breath of death which was not only close by but in the face of which all were equal. This is not going to be a volume of memoirs about my own life. Therefore I am not going to recount the truly amusing details of my arrest, which was like no other. That night the Smirsh officer Tilda gave up their last hope of being able to make out where we were on the map they never had been able to read maps anyway. So they politely handed the map to me and asked me to tell the driver how to proceed to counterintelligence at army headquarters. I, therefore, led them and myself to that prison, and in gratitude they immediately put me not in end ordinary cell but in a punishment cell. And I really must describe that closet in a German peasant house which served as a temporary punishment cell. It was the length of one human body and wide enough for three to lie packed tightly, four at a pinch. As it happened, I was the fourth, shoved in after in at night. The three lying there blinked sleepily at me in the light of the smoky kerosene lantern and moved over, 
giving me enough space to lie on my side, half between them, half on top of them, until gradually, by sheer weight, I could wedge my way in. And so four overcoats lay on the crushed straw-covered floor, with eight boots pointing at the door. They slept and I burned. The more self-assured I had been as a captain half a day before, the more painful it was to crowd onto the floor of that closet. Once or twice the other fellows woke up numb on one side, and we all turned over at the same time.